All right. We've got a lot happening this morning. Right on. Uh, my name is Pastor Tiffany, and my name is Tiffany. I am one of the pastors here along with my husband. Uh, we get the privilege of being able to pastor together this group of Lifeline Church. Can you guys just give it up and celebrate because God is good, and we are family, and we get together every Sunday. And what I love about Lifeline is that we're a church that's making room for friends and family. Uh, we we want to be a church where we're fun and we're engaging and the spirit of the living God is present with us, but we're not weird. <laughs> He's so present with us that it's normal and it's empowering. Uh, and we want to be a place. I grew up going to church and sometimes I didn't want to bring my friends to church because I was like, I love Jesus, but churches can be weird. <laughs> uh, and we, we want to be that place uh, where you feel comfortable to bring your friends and your family because you know that they're going to they're gonna be welcome. They're going to be loved. We're going to be inviting. We're going to be warm. But also, there's going to be a deposit made. Uh, and that deposit is going to carry us through the rest of the week. And we're going to be able, from that deposit, to give things away to the people around us. How many of you would say that, that you want that? You want, you want to be able to give Jesus away to your friends and family. You want what you know to be translatable uh, in the earth. And so we have a mission here at Lifeline. And it is, you can say it with me if you know it, it's to be a lifeline. And we do that by leading people, all the church, into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. With everything we have, we want to give him everything that we have and keep on going. We're three weeks into a series called Legacy. So we're going to jump right into that in a minute. But before I get there, if you like to follow along with notes or you want to look back later in the week, we have an app that you can use. It's the YouVersion Bible app. If you want to, you can pull out your phone and download that app right now. We're okay with that. Um, or you can ask about it later. If you have a um, uh, connection card and you want to turn it into the back, you can ask the back, hey, that, that, app, that app that the lady talked about with the Bible, like you just say that and they'll help you navigate uh, to the YouVersion Bible app. It's where you can follow along with notes, but it's also really cool because if you don't have a paper Bible and you're like, I don't know where to start, but I, you know, maybe I want to start reading scripture, there's a lot of really simple follow along plans that you can use that will just get you reading the Bible, will get you thinking about it. And what's cool is you can also, you can do it with friends. So like you got a friend or a spouse Spouse, you know, like maybe I want to read the Bible with my wife, but it's weird, <laughs> or my husband. And you just do the plan and you guys can talk about it. So it's a really cool feature. I just want to let you know about that. Um, but we're three weeks into our series called Legacy. And every year we take uh, one month out of the year and we, we kind of pull back the layers a little bit and talk. It's kind of about finances, but it's also finances and every, it touches every layer of our life because how many know legacy isn't just about money? Legacy is something we leave uh, for people. So next Sunday, actually the 20th, is our legacy offering. So once a year, we take a special offering. If you've been coming to this church a while, you'll notice that we don't pass baskets. And we're not asking you, like, you just came in, you had great worship, now give us your money. We're not that kind of church. Uh, but once a year, um, we do take some time, and it's an invitation to give above the, the tithe. We do believe in the tithe around here. So above that, there's a legacy offering. And this year, our, our, our motto is, more seats, more souls. More seats, more souls. So um, we, these are new chairs that are in front of you. We don't have, we didn't buy all the chairs. So we used to have these red ones. If you've been here, at, you know, like six weeks or more, you've seen the red chairs. And Pastor Elliot keeps telling this story. But they're so, I showed up to this church in 1997, okay? I've been a part of this church since 1997. Those chairs were here before me. Okay, they were so ancient and rickety. And here's the thing, we were growing, like we're bringing friends and family and, and coming to church and we're seeing lives being changed and people coming. And what was happening is we were running out of space. So what are you gonna do? Buy new chairs to go with these old red ones? Like you can't color match something that's 50 years old, you know? So it was like this, okay, we, we, and our whole plan, our desire behind that was we want the church to be able to partner in, you guys are the church. So we want the church to be able to partner in providing seats for, for friends and family, being a, being a part of that. Uh, but we couldn't wait, so we had to pull the trigger. We bought some chairs, but we didn't buy all the chairs. And so um, Legacy, you'll have an opportunity to give towards that next week if you come back. If you're like, oh, oh heck no. Uh, then I guess you could just skip next week and come the week after that, because we will be doing uh, the Legacy offering. Just being real, okay? Some of you inside were like, crap. Um, okay, so over the last two weeks, we've looked at some universal principles uh, that God has set in place regarding finances and resources. So you guys can go back and watch those. I'm not going to recap them. You can follow us on YouTube, Facebook, social media. We're on there. Uh, today, what I want to do is two things. First, I want to briefly 
shed some light on a phrase that we say around here. At the end of every message, we say it when we talk about something. So I want to just unpack that phrase. And then the second thing I want to do is to lead you to see what God sees. Uh, Because I think for some of us, it will transform the way that we view ourselves. It will transform the way that we view God and ourself in relationship with him. And it will transform the way that we view the church and the the gathering of people together and some of those Christian practices that we have. So that's kind of what I want to do today. And this series, the Legacy Series, is primarily designed to do two things. The first is to help us see how God values or looks at money and resources and then how he's asked us to steward those. And then the other part of the series is that um, he, we want to help us see the other areas in life that become unlocked when we just practice the first one. So when we practice the first one, there are things that become unlocked. I titled this series not because you guys know titles or care, but it's called Invisible Inheritance. There is an inheritance that is unseen that we enter into, and it's unlocked through a tangible thing that we can do. So this is kind of my big thought for the day, and it's borrowed from somebody. This is the big thought. Legacy is not leaving something for people. It's leaving something in people. I'll say that again. Legacy is not leaving something for people. It's leaving something in people. Now, someone shared that quote with me right after we started the Legacy series. And I, I love that. In part, I think it's true. But I think, I think legacy can be both because we can leave something for people, but also we can leave something in people. And this is what I think. I believe that leaving something in people is worth far more than leaving something for people. And here's why. Because what we leave for people, like in a, a house or, or finances, can fade. It can rot. It can be taken away. It can be expired. Um, it can run out. But what we leave in people, the deposit we make in people, can live on. It has the power to be reproduced. It can be exponentially multiplied. And it can keep, it can sustain. Good or bad, because we can leave good things in people and we can leave bad things in people. But whatever, if we put good things in people, it has the power to sustain them long after we're gone because it does something in them and they can keep on giving that. And so here at Lifeline, we want to be a people who do both. We want to be a people who leave things for people and leave things in people. So as I was thinking about that, I'm thinking about inheritance. How many of you would love to just, I mean, I don't think I'm going to inherit anything. (laughs) I don't have rich and I don't have wealthy family members or people that I know who are just going to make it rain uh, when they, when they pass on. But I think, you know, what, even what would I do? Like, let's say I did receive an inheritance and I was planning on getting that. It was something I was counting on. What would I, what would I do with it? What would my plan for it be? I mean, part of it would be amazing because like I could, pro- if it was a, you know, decent inheritance, I mean, I could probably live my dreams and not have to ro- worry about working all the time. You know, like how many of you would love to just have that inheritance where I don't, I don't got to work. I can just fulfill my dreams. I can try new things. I could live a little. I could like have some freedom in my life, not feel like I'm a slave to the man, you know, working so I can, I can have all that stuff. But then I think, but because I don't have a plan for an inheritance, what I would do with it, I think I would rather know the tips and the tools and the tricks that that person, the person who left me the inheritance knew. Like, how were they able to do that? What did they know? What did they practice? How did they live their life in such a way that they were even able to leave behind this, this tangible inheritance? That's what, that's what I want to know. Um, and from where I sit, like, I, I want to be able to steward well my life and resources so that I can leave an inheritance for people. And so from where I I said, I think, I think getting a ridiculous inheritance is not a super loving thing to do unless there's some boundaries put. Okay, you know when people win the lottery? Anybody? Nobody in here has won the lottery. <laughs> Maybe you have. Uh, but when, when you win a lot of money and you don't have a plan for it, it can wreck your life. Because there's like, woohoo, but then everything goes out the window and it changes who, it it can, it has the ability to change who you are, to change how you operate, but once it runs out, you're the same person you were before you won it, you know, and so 
ridiculous inheritance without any boundaries or context on how to, to steward it wisely is probably the most unloving thing that anybody could do because it, it has the power to destroy you unless you learn how to steward it well. And what I love about God is the more that I look into his laws and the more that I look into his ways, the more I see that he does have ridiculous provision for us. He has a ridiculous inheritance for us, but he's loving enough, and I love this, he's loving enough to desire our success and not our complete and utter failure, and just blessing us beyond what we can handle. And so every weekend, this is what I want to unpack, that one phrase. Every weekend, we say kind of the same phrase, and we give everyone an opportunity to take the step of giving. So at the end of every service, we talk about the giving and how people can do that. And this is what we say. We say you give through the church, not to the church. And that's what I want to unpack, that giving through the church, not to the church. Um, I want to give the, you some context and kind of explain why we believe this, because it's not a pitch to give, and it's not some angle. So when you walk out of here today, you don't have to be like, man, that lady talked about giving, so I guess I must. Please don't. <laughs> that's not the heart of this series. I'm going to show you something, and you get to decide what you do with it. You get to wrestle with it. If you're the kind of person who's been wrestling over the tithe and the offering, and like maybe it's a little bit manipulating, or you're, st you're still not sure if you understand it, don't feel pressured to do anything except for continue to wrestle with it. Let the Lord work in your heart. Let him work it out in you. Don't feel obligated or pressured by a pastor or a church or a ministry, but let Jesus do something in your heart. Amen? Okay, so the, the scripture that has come up a lot of time is out of Malachi. I'm only going to read the first half of verse 10. So Malachi 3.10 where the Lord says to the people, he's talking to the Old Testament people, they've been exiled, they've been sent away, and then they're coming back home. And in coming back home, he's reminding them of some parameters. And he says to them, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And I don't want to talk about the tithe today. What I want to talk about is the storehouse. Because that's, well, I'll get there. I want to talk about the storehouse. So the scripture has been used almost every week. Um, and the bringing of the tithe was an Old Testament practice. In the Old Testament, the Israelite people were led, if you guys remember the story or have heard a little bit about the story, you can go back and read it. But in the Old Testament, the Israelite people were led out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God with the signs and the wonders and the 10 plagues, and they crossed through the Red Sea, and then they were on their way to the promised land because the Lord said, I'm going to deliver you out of the hand of slavery. I'm going to deliver you out of that place of oppression and run bring you into a new land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of complete ridiculous inheritance, abundance, provision, and blessing. And while they were traveling to the place the Lord was leading them uh, and the inheritance he intended to give them, uh, it was while they were traveling in that, that place that the Lord gave them the Ten Commandments. You guys are familiar with the Ten Commandments. Surrounding the Ten Commandments was also, maybe less familiar, 613 laws. <laughs> You're so loving. 613 laws. I love that. On top of these 10 commandments. So it was while they were traveling, he brought them out of slavery and he's bringing them into the land of promise. And it is there that he delivers 613 laws plus the 10 commandments. And this is where he breaks down. You guys can go back and read this in Numbers, Deuteronomy, Exodus, and Leviticus. If you want to pour over it, please, I dare you. And then keep coming to church because you're not so bored. <laughs> if you guys have never tried to read Leviticus, whew, just, just go for it and then laugh at how hilarious it is. Okay, so it was while they were traveling that, that the 613 laws were given. And these were regarding food practices. This is where the clean and unclean animals come in, the divided hoof versus the split hoof, and furry animals and non-furry animals and pigs and goats and sheep and birds and, and things with scales. All the food practice came through there. The cleanliness practices, like if you have a boil or a sore, how do you tell if it's uh, an ongoing disease or if it's one that's going to get rid of? Like all the practices to keep the community healthy, that the information on sacrifices, these are all the sacrifices that I'm asking, and this is the regulation and the command for bringing this act. It was, you know, the implementation of festivals because God wanted them to party. You can read that. He's not a God who needed like boringness all the time. He wanted them to celebrate. There was the, the celebration of feasts and weeks. And then he also put boundaries on relationships and community living. This is when he says, don't have a thousand wives, you know, like pick one and stick with it. Also like, don't sleep with your, your mother's uh, husband, like just, you know, normal community things. Like this is where, this is where he gave those. And what this 
is cool because Moses didn't conjure up these ideas. God met him on the mountain. This is where you go back and you're reading. God is meeting with Moses and Moses' face is so bright from meeting with the living God that he has to cover it with the veil because the people are so afraid to go near him because he's literally been with the living God. So it's not, it's not Moses conjuring up these ideas, but the living God is downloading this information to Moses and giving it to the community. And it's within these laws, there was a section on stewarding finances and stewarding resources. It's all in the same area. So in that section, the Lord says, this is what he says, there will be a temple built for my name. And within that temple, there will be a storehouse. Because remember, they're traveling, they're nomads. There's not a temple yet. The temple is coming, there, one will be built. And the storehouse is so that the people who are ministering before me on your behalf will be provided for. Because there's 12 tribes of Israel, okay? 11 of them get an inheritance. The Levites get nothing. Because the... In, the, thanks God, I'm a Levite. And so my inheritance is you. I have no land. I can't earn any money. Life is so good. Like imagine being a Levite. Okay. So the Levites, that was their inheritance. They didn't get land. They, get, they didn't get to work. They didn't get to earn a living. They didn't get to tend animals. Their job was their life. They got to inherit living in the temple and taking care of the sacrifices because every day there was a million bajillion sacrifices that had to come. And it was the Levites response responsibility to remain holy and clean so that they could offer the sacrifices on behalf of the people. And so God says, the rest of you, all 11 tribes of you, need to bring 10% to the storehouse because you're going to provide for the people who are ministering on your behalf. That's what he says. So that's, that's where the storehouse came from, Old Testament, and that was why. So really, guys, if you peel back the layers, that's a lesson on community. That's not, it's less a lesson on giving and a less, you know, like bring 10% or you'll be smoked. It's in reality, this is what Jesus says. This is what the Lord says. He says, all the resources I'm giving you, that land I brought you into, that land of freedom, that land flowing with milk and honey, all your resources there are shared. I brought you there and these people are going to do a work on your behalf. And so you're in community now. What you have belongs to them. What they're going to do belongs to you. This is a lesson on community and shared resources. In other words, Jesus or the Lord says, I intend for you to be a sharing and a giving people dependent upon each other. So in the New Testament, that's great because that's Old Testament. In the New Testament, once Jesus came, the temple was eventually destroyed. You can read about that. And once Jesus was crucified, because remember, Jesus came, lived, and then he was crucified. Once he was crucified, he was the one sacrifice for sin. So everything the Levites did became obsolete. They didn't need to do what they were doing anymore. And then later, the temple becomes destroyed. And so this is, this is what's interesting. The temple disappears. The sacrifices that the Levites made disappear. But what's interesting is that the storehouse doesn't go away. The storehouse doesn't go away. And this is about to get wild. Let me show it to you. At one point, some Jewish people in Jesus' day, you can read about in, Mark, in the Gospels, some Jewish people are talking about the physical temple and how beautiful it is and how ornate it is and how, how, how it's just amazing. And Jesus, he, I just sometimes I wonder what the heck was Jesus thinking? You know, like, who are you really? Uh, he's standing there. He's, over in the, he's overhearing the conversation and he says, Oh yeah, he doesn't say oh yeah. He says, destroy that temple and in three days I will rebuild it. And so the people look at him like, okay, Gracie. Because it took, it took years to build the ornate temple and Jesus, one man, really one man in three days are gonna rebuild the temple. So they just, you know, they, they wrote him off as a lunatic basically and said, that guy's crazy. Um, so, so there was that. But the um, apostles, the disciples were with him and they overheard him say that. And when Jesus had resurrected from the dead, they began to understand that Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his own body. And so, and so what that does is because after he died and was re resurrected and the Jesus followers remembered that, it was written in the scriptures. He wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his body. He is the temple, which means the storehouse is inside of him. Let me show you this. The temple was where the sacrifices were made. It was also where the bread of the presence 
was kept continually aromatic before the, the, throne of, the throne of heaven, before the throne of God. It was where worship to God happened. And Jesus is all of those things. He is the bread of life who has come down from heaven. He is the temple where we come and we bring, he, he made the sacrifice. So all the sacrifices that were made were made in him. So it is through him that our offering of worship is made acceptable and pleasing to God. So we can't physically, so if Jesus is the storehouse, okay, that's great. We can't physically give to Jesus. Jesus. Like, can you, can any of you see him? No. <laughs> so the question is, if Jesus is the storehouse now, do this, this is my question, do the same boundaries apply to us in the New Testament, because we're, we're part of the New Testament, that apply to the Old Testament people, the Israelites. So scripture says Jesus is the head of the church. It says he's the head of the church and the body is his physical representation. So the church is Jesus' physical representation and the earth. So we're going to read some scriptures, which are letters who the Apostle Paul wrote to one of the early churches. Okay, Now this is Paul who started the first Christian churches in the Middle East. And let me tell you who he's talking to. He is not talking to Jewish people who understand the idea of the tithe. He's not talking to Jewish people who understand the idea of the sacrifice. He is talking to non-Jewish people, people like you and me, who have given their life to Jesus. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. He says, he's talking to, to people just like us. He says, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? And that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. Now, they, they didn't practice that, but they lived in a community and an environment and a culture where it was practiced. So they saw it, but they didn't practice it. Does that make sense? So he says, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? Those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. And he says, in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. What does that sound like? Levites. That sounds like the Levite. There are still, in other words, he's saying as an apostle and as a, as a, as a person who's going around church, planting churches, he's saying, the Lord has called me to do this and you're benefiting from my response to the Lord's call. And we're still a community of people. So what the Lord is doing in you, you give back so that the Lord can continue to do in you and through you and, and elsewhere. So he isn't being harsh here. What he's doing is he's helping people just like us see that we have a role to play in what God is doing. Because Many of us wouldn't say that I'm going to respond to the call of the gospel and I'm going to go plant a church and I'm going to go tell hundreds of people about Jesus. But you know what? We sure as heck honor and believe and are grateful for the people who do do that. Amen? People across the world where we can celebrate. And so what it is, is it's an opportunity to give to the storehouse, give to the church through Jesus, and you play a role in every person everywhere who's given their life to Jesus because you're a part of that. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. But Paul is helping them see that in essence, he says, my people are going to care for my people. My people are going to care for my people. That doesn't go away. Later, in that same letter, we're going to stay in Corinthians, verse 16, 1 and 2. This is what he told another church. He says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And then I'm going to jump right into the second part, and I'll tie it all together. In his second letter to them, he further clarifies giving, and he says this, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So now what I want to do is just break down God's boundaries on giving real quick, okay? So the first is that it's a collection given to a central location. When, when the Lord asks us to give, and he talks about bringing things to the storehouse, he's talking about giving it to a central location. It's not an individual. Get this. You guys can go and read about this in Luke chapter 8. Jesus' ministry was funded primarily by women. It says that there were three women, the, the Bible names, three women specifically who were funding the ministry of Jesus. And this is really cool. <laughs> not cool. Okay. Uh, you guys ever heard like, I don't want to give to a ministry or an organization. I don't want to give through the church because I don't know what the people are doing with it. Right? Like I don't trust the organization behind it. Do you know that, that, that Judas stole from Jesus? It says that Judas helped himself to the money pot. 
So Jesus, he's, people are giving to the ministry of Jesus, and one of Jesus' own people is robbing them. Like, okay, so I, I, I get it, but I, I want to unpack the idea that like, all churches and organizations and, and people who collect money are evil, because that's not evil. Jesus wasn't evil. There was a man in his company who was. And I hate to say this, but he got dealt with. He made a bunch of poor choices that led ultimately to the demise and end of his life. And so it was dealt with. But the rest of Jesus' ministry, it it wasn't. And when they were giving to that collection of people, it wasn't just, they weren't giving it straight to Jesus. It went into the central pot so they could eat, so they could travel, so they could sleep somewhere, so they they could keep on giving and ministering. So Jesus received a collection from people in order to do the ministry while he was on earth. Because while he was a carpenter, and while they were fishermen, they were doing the work of the ministry. So they stopped doing the work in order to do this other work, and then they were provided for. So it's a collection given to a central location. It is regular, planned, and proportional, not manipulated. Um, so in other words, decide beforehand. So it's anytime you give to anything, it should not be coerced or attached to emotion. If it is, go back and think through the emotion and then decide whether or not you really want to give based on principle. And, and then come back and do it. But never let it be coerced or, or attached to emotion or, or manipulated. So, and then giving is an investment of money, not an expense. So we don't count when, when we give. It's not, when I'm not, I'm not spending money. I'm investing money. It's an investment into what God is doing. So you're not paying or buying a commodity. And you're not, it's not a transfer of goods. It's an investment I'm going to talk about this right now. There is nothing more diversified than giving to the kingdom. Can I tell you just this year what some of the giving through this church has done? Can I tell you that? Can I tell you that? There were 17 people water baptized this year. There were 73 churches planted across the U.S. and the world. Just this year alone through what your giving did. There were, this is really cool. We, we give through an org, we, so as the money comes into the church, the church collectively gives to different ministries and org, we invest and we sow your money, your resources into other parts of the kingdom. The very first Bible in the Tibetan language was printed. This year through your giving. There's, there's another one, 13, so we, at the beginning of the year, remember there's still stuff going on in Ukraine and you guys had the opportunity, you guys still, it's an ongoing opportunity to give to Ukraine and, and the work going on there. But through that giving, 13,000 people a month are being fed in five locations in Ukraine. Your giving is doing that because you bring it here and we give it there. Over 1,000 people have given their life to Jesus through the response of the people in Ukraine. Amen. Talk about diversify. You know, when, if, you, if you're going to plan for your retirement, you're going to invest and you got to diversify your portfolio so that you get returns everywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and then you get. Ooh, you hand it off to the, the, the expert because you're like, I don't know what that means. And then you watch it all the time. When you give to the kingdom, you are, I mean, the diversification in your portfolio is huge. And it's, I called it invisible inheritance because it's not going to rain in your pocket finances. But what's going to happen is there are people all across the globe because of your giving who have been transformed. You talk, okay, we, this, just to make it real practical, how many of you love coming to a building where you can sit in a chair? Because we could do church at the park. Every week, we could go out, rain or shine, and we can meet in the, in the park because we're a diehard community of faith-filled believers, you know, and rain or shine, we're going to go do that. Do your friends and family want to go sit in the rain so they can meet Jesus? No, probably not. So for like a week or two, you're like, yes, I'm all in. And then it gets hard and it gets uncomfortable. And you're like, wouldn't it be great if we like had a building, you know? We can like get together. And so what, what happens is the church, the collection of people, we come together in a space where we can gather and we give. We give toward it. We make an investment in the place that we come together because we love gathering together. We love having a place where, where we can, the words are up on the dang screen so we can know what the heck these songs are. Because some of them are so wordy, you've never heard them before. And you're like, I'm so lost. Uh, and so we, we, our giving is so dumb. It's so dumb. Because it's not a transfer of goods, it's an investment in the kingdom, and it seems really, really dumbly practical. But on the other side of it, there, there are people being impacted through the, through the monies and the giving that we bring uh, to the storehouse. And then the, another boundary is giving is a sincere test of our love for God and for others. It's in essence, is saying, God, I love what you're doing. I love what you've done for me, and I want the same thing to happen in other people. So it's saying, count me in. 
Count me in. I want to be an investor in your kingdom. I want to further this kingdom. That's not a business. I want to further what you're doing on the earth. So the storehouse, in their case, the Christian people were bringing their giving to the place where they met at the beginning of each week. For you, maybe Sunday's the last day of the week. I don't know. Or the first day of the week. But in our modern culture, we still have a place where we meet every week. We still have a place where we come together and where ministry happens. It's where you are invested. It's where you are impacted. It's where you invite others to experience what God has for them. It's your local church. And that's why we say you give through the church, not to the church, because we're not collecting your money and hoarding it. We're collecting your money and we're diversifying it across the kingdom in our community and across the world. Um, I want to circle back to that first idea that legacy isn't about leaving something for someone. It's leaving something in someone and kind of tie all of this together. So remember at the beginning when I said the Israelites were led out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God with signs and wonders. The nation of people, the Israelites, if you go back and you just look at any ancient culture, they were surrounded by other people groups who were doing the same exact thing. They were offering sacrifices to a God. But the difference is that the the nations around them were offering sacrifices in order to appease a God. In other words, they didn't have a relationship with the you guys can read about it. You grew up in high school, you know, you, if you remember your history classes. But they would offer their sons and daughters in the fire. And they would, they would dance around and, and like they would cut their skin and they would tattoo themselves. And they had all these kind of intense practices. And the intense practice was so that the gods would be pleased with them. It was so that the God would make it rain or, you know, they would, there would be a release of harvest. It was in order to, I'm going to do this so that I can get something from you because you won't give me anything unless I, I first make a huge sacrifice. Um, I would say this, even today, most of our subconscious thoughts probably tell us if there is a God, and if I want to be right by that God, I must somehow appease him. I must make some kind of sacrifice or do something in order to show him that I don't, I don't, I don't need to be killed, I don't need to be destroyed, or that something. Maybe if we want breakthrough or we want forward momentum in our life, like there's something I can do to make this God happy so, so that he'll be happy with me. And if we're honest, I would say this, maybe even our motive for coming to church sometimes is so that God will be pleased and we can ask him for something. Like you've been so far from God for so long and like maybe as a child you thought maybe this God is real but I never really knew him and so I, I kind of want to ask him for something so I'm going to go to church first. And after I go to church for a while, maybe he'll be able to, to answer me or maybe I'll earn the right to ask him a question. Maybe I'll earn the right um, to, to, to be like those other people and see what he does. Uh, maybe if you're serving on the dream team, you know, you're already, you gave your life to Jesus, you gave your life to Christ. Uh, but maybe even for us who serve on the dream team, um, it's so that God sees you giving. Like maybe there's still kind of a brokenness in your relationship with the Lord where like, yeah, I, you know, I, I know Jesus and all that stuff, but I'm, I'm, I still have to serve. I still have to give back in some way so that God can be happy with me. Maybe, maybe even like our motive for giving a monetary gift for actually giving is so that God won't be angry with us or so that we can check the box that says, well, God, I, I did that. I checked the box. Like whatever it is, sometimes in our subconscious, I think we still wrestle with that. A lot of us in some form or fashion still wrestle with that. Something inside of us tells us that God is angry with us or that we can't ask God for something. He's too big. He's too powerful. He's too separate. And he needs to be soothed by our actions before we can enter into his presence. But on the other end of that, something inside of us desperately just wants to be okay. Something inside of us just desperately wants God to, to not be angry with us. So I want to go back to the Israelites. The Israelites didn't make a sacrifice before God rescued them. Abraham traveled the, he called Abraham out, and Abraham traveled that whole land. And it was, God told Abraham, he said, my people, your descendants are going to be slaves for 400 years in the land of Egypt. And then I'm going to bring them out, and they're going to inherit this. So can I, God gave the promise of deliverance over 500 years before it happened. God decided, I'm going to rest. And so 
they go into the land of, and it's eventually it's, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob had his 12 sons, and then it was Joseph who ended up there, and so Joseph brings the whole family back, and so they know the story of this God who called out, you know, Grandpa Abraham, but they don't know God. They don't know him. It, they, don't, they don't know the God that, that Abraham served. And so they didn't do anything except for cry out and say, God, if you're real, would you save us? And he did. Then he brought Moses, and then it was the, the, ten, the ten plagues, and he brought them out. Those 600, and so then it was after he brought them out. It was after, guys, hear this. It was after he rescued them that he gave them 613 laws and commandments. And I know that seems absurd and ridiculous, but they were... God's requirements, they were a containment line around. It wasn't, it wasn't, the 1613 laws and commandments weren't do this and then you'll be right with me. It was, I've already rescued you and I want you to stay free. I want you to stay healthy. I want you to stay blessed. I want you to stay provided for. And so stay within these boundary lines and I can keep doing what I've been doing. And so it wasn't, appease me, and then I'll give you this. He said, I'm giving you this, now stay here so I can keep on doing it. It was a very distinct God from the gods of the other nations. In fact, uh, one of the, and this was so that part of it was because he said, Israelite people, I'm setting you apart. And I want the other nations to know that I exist and I'm real. And so I need you to do this so that they can see me. One of the, I love this, one of the craziest laws that God gave his people was the Sabbath day of rest. Our God is such a giving God that he said, all the other nations are going to work hard seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They're going to build things. They're going to do things. They're going to strive hard. They're going to work hard. And he says, but you, I've given you the seventh day as a day of rest. And he says, so you, on the seventh day, don't do any work. Take the day off. Be free. Rest. Enjoy each other. And it, it wasn't a command saying, take the seventh day off or you're you know, going to be punished. It was take the seventh day off so I can show the rest of the world what can happen in six days with me. He, and those promises still stand today. The, the Sabbath is still a promise. A, 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 in your workplaces and in your families, you know to the left of you and to the right of you are people who are working overtime to make things happen. They are striving so hard. And there's a guilt that says, I can't take a day off unless I get all my work done. Can I tell you that if the church would practice some of the things that God has given us, we would revolutionize the, the way the world sees the church and the way the world sees the kingdom. Because if we were to take God out of his word and just take that, that day off just take a day of rest and then your people look around you well, why, why are you doing that because you should be working hard my God says he'll do he'll do more in six days than I could ever do in seven and it gives them a freedom and a permission so who is this God who loves you so much that he would do that and it doesn't make sense you're trying to explain it to your friend like I, I don't know I don't think they believe me if I told them that like just just try it and see what God does to those really awkward conversations where you don't know everything about everything but you know who your God is and you're taking him at his word and he's showing up. The 613 commandments were never the salvation plan. It was always Jesus. You can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And he's talking to Adam and Eve because they sinned. And this is what the Lord says. He says that the snake is going to bruise the heel of the woman's seed. But the woman's seed is going to crush the head of the serpent. That was Jesus. The salvation plan was prophesied way back in the very beginning of the book in Genesis. Our God is not one who needs us to grovel or offer sacrifices to make him happy with us. We don't need to get it together and offer sacrifices before he can rescue us out of our dark pit of despair or our frustration or that broken relationship or that severed marriage. He's an abundant giver and he's the abundant provider and he has always made a way for his people. Can I tell you that you're his people, whether or not you believe in Jesus or not, you're his people. And you're here today because you're his people and he's drawing you close and he's drawing you near and he says, son, daughter, I want you to hear me. I want you to know me. I, you can ask me for whatever it is that you want and I love to give. In our cultures uh, and the, the cultures around them, the nations had to offer sacrifices to their gods before they could ask for something. The living creator God gave first before the people asked. 500 years before they asked, he made the provision. 
He rescued them, and then as an act of love, so they wouldn't forget what kind of a God he is, he set boundary lines around them, which would serve as reminders. This is huge. They would, those boundary lines and those commandments and those laws would serve as reminders for them that the God they served wasn't like the God of the other nations. He's different. He is the God who leaves things in us, not the God who exacts things from us. That's the kind of God we serve. I didn't read the rest of that Malachi scripture because I roll my eyes every time I hear it. (sighs) But that invitation to put the Lord to the test was for the people, not for God. And in other words, he says, if you take me at my word, they would lack nothing. He says, put me to the test. When he says, put me to the test, he's not angry. He says, put me to the test because I want you to see what I see. Put me to the test because I want you to see that these are boundary lines for your good. Put me to the test because I want to throw open the heavens so that there will be so much that you will not lack anything. He gave to them not because they earned it, but because he wanted to. And so those, that cycle of, of, we're talking about legacy, we're talking about giving, kind of unpacking the tithe. When we bring that and, and we're faithful to do it, we're faithful to practice it, it's a built-in cycle of thanksgiving and blessing because every time we give, we're reminded that our God gave first. And every time we bring it back and he provides for us, we're reminded that our God is the God who blesses everything. And we become set apart from every other nation. And that was Old Testament, but New Testament, this is what it says. It says, after Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus' followers become a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The church collectively are a people set apart. And when we take God at his word, not to check that box, not to appease God, not to somehow make him happy, but because we believe that he has a different way, we become a light in the darkness and other people can find us. And other people can find the hope and the healing that they desire. Let's go ahead and pray. If you wouldn't mind closing your eyes and just bowing your heads. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. And I thank you for your abundant provision and your abundant blessing. I thank you, God, that you're the God who gives to us before we even ask. Before we knew we needed anything, you made the provision for us. In your son, Jesus, you have provided for us everything that we need. And when we discover that we need it and we just come to you and ask, you're so faithful to give that to us. Lord, and so I thank you for who you are and for what you're doing. If there's, we do this every week, we give an opportunity for people to respond to the Lord. So if you're in the room and you feel like, I don't know that God, I'm still trying to appease this God I don't really have a relationship with. And you would instead say, I want to get to know this God and be in relationship with the God who gave first. And I just want to invite you to lift your hand, not because lifting your hand is something special, but it's just an indication of saying, I'm seeing and I'm responding to what the Lord is doing. Amen. I see your hand. Awesome. God is so good. Amen. Why don't you, we're just going to go ahead and church. If you would repeat this together with me, Father God, Father God I thank you for your generosity. You have given me everything I need before I even ask. Help me to see you that way. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who I need. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead me to do what's right. 